Okay, so welcome everyone to the sixth lecture of Dr. Hadi Step 1 for the new batch of students for Microbiology and Basic Sciences. Thank you so much for joining the lecture. If you guys can hear my voice, can I get a yes in the chat box, please? Okay. okay, thank you so much. And we apologize for starting the class a little bit later. We're just going through some uh, inconvenience. And, um, but hopefully it will not affect our um, goal for today, that is, our goal for finishing uh, parasitology, which we will be uh, doing. Now, um, before I begin, can we jump straight right into the lecture today instead of uh, doing the revision and recaptivation from mycology, yes or no? Give me one second, please. Now, uh, so yesterday we finished mycology. The day before that, we finished gram negative bacteria. And the week before that, we finished gram positive bacteria and basic bacteriology. Now, before I begin the lecture for today, um, I just want to ask if you, if you guys have been doing the questions from U World. If you guys have, can I get a yes on the chat box, please? And how many questions have you guys been doing? Twenty. Okay. Anyone else? Nineteen. Okay. There's a next student. Next student. Did next student? Can I get some answers from the next student? Fourteen. Okay. Tw Twenty. Nineteen. Fourteen. Okay. Good. Uh, did you guys um, find questions that were common to our lectures? Yes or no? So I suppose you guys have been doing um, questions from microbiology or is it biochemistry? Microbiology, okay, good. Give me one second. Even questions that the professor got right with what um, that's good. That, that's good to know. Okay. Thank you so much for putting your attention. Now, just give me one second. I'm just feeling a little bit under the weather today. I apologize. Just give me one second over here. <clears throat> Can I get everyone's attention very quickly? Is can everyone hear my voice? No. So yesterday we finished mycology. We told you guys um, the high yield information from mycology, which you need to know. If you guys can remember all of those, then that's 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 more or less enough. Today, what we're going to do is today we're going to start with parasitology. Now, parasitology is also very very high yield, and parasitology for the purpose of your step one exam is also taken a little bit advantage for because uh, the USM step one, uh, the people who are responsible for making the questions, they're aware that we deal with bacteria on a daily basis. We deal with viruses on a, on a daily basis, not so much for fungi because we do not come across a lot of immunocompromised individuals. That's why they do not ask a lot of questions regarding mycology. But when it comes to parasitology, they know that that's their um, secret weapon to um get you guys you, you you understand what i mean so your understanding of parasitology will separate you from your marks in the 20s and 30s to 30s and 40s basically so like a 10 point jump here and there 
So that's how important parasitology is. Just wanted to lay it out before I begin the lecture. Now, parasitology, when I say this, I need you guys to remember some things over here. First and foremost, in parasites, we have certain types of divisions. Well, what are the divisions that we have? Number one, number one, The number one division that we have is in parasites, we have, we have protozoas, yes or no? You have heard of protozoa? Yes, all right, that. Number two in parasites, we have nematodes. Okay, we have nematodes. Then number three in parasites, we have what we call as cystodes. Yes or no? Cystodes. Number four. In parasites, we have another one which we call as trematodes. So if you can imagine that these are what they are, is they are the family or the genus of parasites. And the fifth one falls under ectoparasite, meaning that these are the type of parasites that will survive outside of your body. These are ectoparasites. Okay, so that's basically what it is. Now we're going to talk about all of these one by one, and we're going to talk about how the questions are being asked in your step one exam and how to answer them correctly each and every time. Now, before further ado, in your first aid book, you have the name of the organism, you have the clinical features of the organism, right? Then you have how the organism is transmitted, and then you have transmission, and then you have treatment. Now, as a rule of thumb, the questions have to be made from over here. The questions have to be made from the, from the clinical features and the mode of transmission. The answers are going to lie either over here that they want you to figure out the name of the organism or over here that they want you to figure out the treatment for the organism. If they want you to figure out the name for the organism, the question is very easy. And if they want to take it up a notch, they will ask you about the treatment, meaning that they are trying to go for a bit more harder questions. So that's that. So with that being said, the whole point of this discussion is after we are done with our lecture for today, I want to aware you that I do not want you guys to learn or revise the information in this way. I want you guys to revise the information in either, in either this way or this way. Meaning that, meaning, for example, over here, this is, for example, let's take giardiasis as an example. So in your question stem, you will get a question about a patient who comes to you with bloating, flatulence, foul smelling, petty diarrhea. However, they want to put it with a history of camping and this and that. And they can ask you um, that I mean, the diagnosis that they see that there are multinucleotides, trophozoids. What is the name of the organism? So your name would be your answer. This A for answer A is over here in terms of geodesis. Sometimes they can also ask you the treatment. So that's basically what I'm trying to say over here. Are we clear? Yes or no? Okay. So have I made myself clear on how to revise parasitology for maximum, um, with the maximum efficiency is what I mean. Yes or no? Good. Now, let's talk about the first one. Let's talk about, uh, Let's, let's talk about the first one. Let's, let's talk about protozoas. Okay, let's talk about protozoas. Now, well, when we talk about protozoas, these organisms, they can survive in different parts of the body, especially in four regions. Number one, in the GI tract. Number two, in the CNS. Number three, in the blood, or we would say E. Number four are in certain visceral organisms. I wanna begin the lecture today by talking about the protozoas that survives in the GI tract. These could be remembered by 
these three letters, G, E, C. The next one for CNS, the organisms that affect CNS in terms of parasitology, these organisms could be remembered with the mnemonic T, N, T. For heme, the organism could be remembered by P, B. And for visceral tract, for visceral organs, could be remembered by P. That's it. Are we clear, everyone? Yes or no? Are we clear? So that's it. Now let's let's talk about the first one, the GI organism. So this is basically the introduction of parasitology, and that's how we're gonna do. Uh, the first aid, the information in first aid, that's how we're going to revise and understand them. Now, let's talk about the first one. Let's talk about the GI organisms. So what are what were the letters for the GI organisms? Fast answers, please. The letters for the GI organisms were GEC. Very good. Thank you so much for keeping your attention. Okay, always remember the ball of focus. Okay, the ball of focus needs to be on parasitology today, okay? So number one, G, G4. G4, geodiasis or G4 gangster, which one? Geodiasis. Geodiasis, all right. So let's begin with geodiasis. First of all, what is geodiasis? Geodiasis is basically a parasite that is very, very highly responsible for causing watery diarrhea. This watery diarrhea is basically going to follow uh, abdominal pain, abdominal cramps, and this watery diarrhea will be uh, mixed with stool, with uh, fatty stool. So what happens is for your step one exam, you need to understand that the questions are going to come about a patient who comes to you with a history of, with a history of camping. The patient will have a history of camping and the patient will have a history of drinking, history of drinking water, history of drinking water from, from, a, from a lake. So the patient will have a history of camping, the patient will have a history of drinking water from a lake. And um, another one is that what, what happens is that the patient after that, they will have an incubation period for one to three days after, after which they'll come to you with bloating, flatulence, and foul smelling diarrhea. And what happens is, how, how are they transmitted? They're transmitted because in the water, they are present in the form of cysts, in the form of cysts. Okay. Now, let's see how they are transmitted. Okay. Either, if they are in the cystic form, this is how they're gonna look like. If they're in the cystic form, then this is how they will look like. They will look like an oval shaped ball, something like this, okay, with a covering, okay, because if, they, if it doesn't have a cover, it cannot, it cannot survive. And then in the middle, there will be these structures from, for your understanding and for your remembrance, I want you to remember these structures as bowel loop structure. Okay. These structures, they look like loops of bowel. Are we clear? Yes or no? Okay, good. Another way that they can be transmitted is that they can be transmitted in the form of trophozoids. And this is extremely high yield and very easy to remember. This is a very particular of geodiasis and this is a very, um, important diagram, meaning that this is a this is how the GI dies. This is a mature form of a GI dye, where they will have a kite with the, these sort of four eyes, if, if you will. Okay, that's how they move. Are we clear? Yes or no? As simple as that. That's all you need to know from GI diocese. How do you treat GI diocese treatment? Treatment of geodiasis is with metronidazole. 
that's all. Are we clear? Okay. Now let's begin with the second one. This one we're going to talk about entamoeba histolytica. Okay. What is the strain with loops called? The, the strain with loops is called cysts. It's called cysts. Okay. That's it. Now, let's begin with the second one. The second one, the what what was the second letter for GI parasites? E. E4 and amoeba histolytica. Are you clear? E4 and amoeba histolytica. Okay. Now, what is entamoeba histolytica? Entamoeba histolytica is responsible for causing, as we call, as is amoebic, amoebic dysentery. Okay. It's, it's responsible for, for causing amoebic dysentery. Now, how do we get the transmission? First and foremost, when I'm saying GI, then that must mean that all of these organisms, these three organisms, they have to get transmitted by fecal oral route, yes or no? They have to get transmitted. They have to get transmitted by fecal oral route. So just as how giardiasis was transmitted by fecal oral route, endemic hysolytica is also transmitted by fecal oral route. And what happens is when it does get um, transmitted, okay, so what happens, okay, so, this is the person's, this, this is obviously the person's nose. This is the mouth, right? So this is the entry of the amoeba. This will go all the way down and this will go to the GI tract, right? From the GI tract, where will the blood go? After the blood absorbs all the nutrients, the blood will obviously go to a, a checkpoint. What is the first checkpoint? Liver, okay. And every organism follows this route, except the fact that the liver lets certain organism pass, but certain organisms does not, do not pass the liver. They start accumulating inside the liver. And amoeba is one of those organisms. And amoeba is one of those organisms, meaning that they will form, when, when they're passed from the blood through the liver, they will form this sort of an abscess. This is called an amoebic liver abscess. So what they do is that they produce an ulcer that looks like a flask. It's a flask shaped ulcer. So if you were to see this ulcer from over here like this, if you were to see this ulcer from over here like this, this is how the ulcer would look like. Let's say that um, this is the liver. This is basically the ulcerated margin of the liver. And over here, you have the collection of the pus. Now, there's a very famous name for the pus that is collected over here. The famous name for the pus that's collected is called, does, does anyone know the name of the pus? It's called an anchovy sauce pus. Anchovies sauce pus. Are we clear? Yes or no? This looks like an anchovy sauce. Do you guys know what an anchovy, an anchovy is? Have you guys had anchovies with pizzas? This is the color of anchovy sauce. Okay, this is how the anchovy pus looks like. Are we clear, yes or no? Same color, yes? Okay, good. So that's basically what it is. Now, how do they cause these kind of uh, degradations? Basically, they release what? Amoebas, they release protease enzymes. They release prote proteolytic enzymes that degrades the liver uh, parenchyma. And then there's accumulation of neutrophils, macrophages, and that results in the transformations of those things into pus, as simple as that. Okay, now, how are they transmitted? They're transmitted in the form of cysts. And amoeba histolytica is transmitted in the form of cysts. And um, what happens is that when they are transmitted, they look something like this. Okay. They look something like this. This is the cystic form in which they are transmitted. Okay. Do you guys remember the Reed Sternberg cell? Yes or no? That owl's eye appearance of the Reed Sternberg cells. 
Yes. Right. You can use a reed Sternberg cells appearance for the appearance of the entire vesicle, but they have these sort of owl's eye appearance. And another high yield is when they enter the blood, what would happen? What would happen if, when if they enter the blood? If they enter the blood, then this is, this is what will happen. What, what happens is that when they enter the blood, these organisms, they're larger than RBC themselves. So what they do is that they start accumulating RBCs inside them, inside them that look something like this. So these are engulfed RBCs. Are we clear? Yes or no? Okay. These are engulfed RBCs. So this is what you see. This is what you see in, let's say, the feces of the patient. This is what you see in the blood or the peripheral blood film of the patient. Okay, as simple as that. Now, what are some other sign symptoms the patient will come and tell you? First and foremost, the patient will come and tell you about bloody diarrhea, fever, jaundice, and pain in the right upper quadrant. On ultrasonogram, the first thing that you're gonna do is take detailed history, do physical examination, then perform a bedside ultrasonogram. And then the bedside ultrasonogram, what are you gonna see? You're gonna see something like this. So you can easily connect the dots. A patient comes to you with bloody diarrhea and, and uh, painful growth in the liver. You can connect the dots that, that the organism is antennae behistolytica. So what do you do? The next thing is that to prepare the patient for treatment, as simple as that. Okay. After you make your diagnosis, you, you, you wanna treat the patient. Now, how do you treat the patient? You treat the patient with metronidazole. Are we clear? Okay. You treat the patient with metronidazole. Okay. And there are some, there are two more things that you need to do. Okay. Two more things that you need to do. Number one is you treat the patient with metronidazole, that's number one. And if anyone else has the same sign symptoms, but they're asymptomatic, but they're asymptom. I mean, if anyone else has the same, uh, what can I say? Um, if, they, if they come and tell you that they were in the same uh, area when the thing got transmitted, let's say a group of five people, they all ate the same food. Give me one second. You guys must think that I live in front of a factory or something, right? Don't you? That I'm, I must live in front of a factory or my house is in front of, or it's, it's in front of some construction, right? It's just, it's just New York. That's exactly what it is. Right? There's a street cleaning there. They're cleaning the streets, and um, that's what that, and um, that's basically what, what's happening over here. I'm not sure if you guys are aware that when they're speed cleaning, we have to move the car back and forth and all of those things. It was one of the worst things ever. Now, so where were we now? Metronidazole. Now, let's say that there were a group of five friends who went to eat at, at a same restaurant and one of them came back with, met, with a B sign symptoms. Isn't there a possibility that three or four other of them could have the same sign symptoms in the future? Yes or no? It's just that they're asymptomatic. So what do you do for the friends? So for the friends, you give them iodoquinol. Okay. This is another sort of anti-parasite. Okay. Are we clear? Yes or no? Okay. Good. Paramomycin. Paramomycin is not very high yield. Paramomycin is, is high yield for another, organ, for another organism. We'll talk about paramomycin later. Yeah. Now, let's talk about cryptosporidin, the last one. Okay. The last one, we're going to talk about cryptosporidin. Cryptosporidium. Cryptosporidium, okay. If I tell you that there is a patient who has uh, HIV now comes to you with meningitis, which organism are you going to think about that's high yield? Patient with HIV. 
with meningitis. Cryptococcus. What if I tell you there's a patient who comes to you with pneumonia with HIV? What, which organism will you think about? Pneumocystis. Now, <clears throat> if I tell you there's a patient who comes to you with diarrhea, I need you guys to think about cryptosporidium. Are we clear? Yes or no? This will call, this will call, this will cause severe diarrhea. Severe. Severe diarrhea. And I mean just uh, the patient will be in severe, severe distress and will have massive electrolytic imbalance. Patient needs to be admitted to the hospital ASAP. Severe diarrhea with, uh, I mean, not with, in immunocompromised or especially in acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. Okay. Not even HIV in acquired immunodeficiency syndrome will have this. How, how do they get transmitted? They are transmitted in the form of, they're transmitted in the form of oocysts, okay? In the form of oocysts. So how do they look like? They have a very um, non-high, uh, the, I mean, the appearance of these organisms, of these cysts, they're not very high yield because how they look like, are, I mean, it's very difficult to do, differentiate them. The reason being because is because they look like red balls like this, as simple as that. They have no um, distinctive feature which will allow you to separate them. So that's basically that. So that's basically what I'm trying to say over here. So you will not receive a question about their transmission, but however, you will receive a question about a patient who comes to you with severe diarrhea with having HIV, the CD4 count being less than 500, and uh, you have to connect the dots and make sure that you choose the answer as cryptosporidium. If that's how they want to make the question, a little bit easy. But if they want to take it up a notch and ask you about the treatment, then the name of the drug over here is, um, is a little bit difficult, okay? Now, the name of the drug is what we call as nitrosoxonide, okay? Nitrosoxonide. I need you guys to imagine something like this. Okay. I need you guys to imagine. Something like this. Bullets. And this is your um, cryptosporidium eggs. Okay. These are nitrous bullets. Nitrous bullets or oocysts. Okay. I mean, if you guys have this small image in your mind, hopefully you will not forget the treatment, nitrous oxalate. Are we clear? Yes or no? Okay. Now, quick questions, quick answers. Um, let's see. Okay. What is this organism? Cystic giardiasis. What is this organism? Trophozoidic giardiasis. What is this organism that has eaten up all your RBCs? What is this organism that looks Okay. This is what? This is entamoeba, trophozoidic entamoeba. Very good. What is this organism that looks like a reed Sternberg cell? Cystic entamoeba, right? This is the entamoeba cyst. Okay. And the last one was cryptosporidium. So that's all. So that's all about, um, that's, all, all, that's all about the GI parasites. Now let's talk about the next one. Okay. Is, is everyone understanding the lecture? Yes or no? We're trying our best to make sure that we give you exactly what you need, nothing more than that, so that you guys are exactly aware of how to solve the difficult and the easy questions, both of them together. Okay, so let's keep our attention. Let's bring our ball of focus back to 
the CNS parasite, the CNS protozoas. Okay, CNS protozoas. Do you, do you guys remember the letters for CNS protozoas? Okay, the letters have the same name as a famous ACDC song. It's called TNT. Yes. Has anyone heard of TNT? No. Good. Now let's 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 talk about TNT. With TNT, what do we have? Okay. The first one is a very high yield one. This is called toxoplasmosis, cat scratch disease, or toxoplasma gondii. Now, this is either this is either pronounced as toxoplasma gondii. Some people would prefer if you call this toxoplasma gondii, however you want to pronounce it. But what you do have to remember about this is that this is a very high yield organism for a very high yield disease. That is, uh, this is re responsible for causing um, uh, disease, which affects your CNS in the form that it forms a ring enhancing lesion in the brain. How many of us are aware of this, that it forms a ring enhancing lesion in the brain? Please write me in the chat box. Yes? Oh, good. Okay. Now let's talk about this. What is Toxoplasma gondii? Toxoplasma gondii is basically um, a disease that is spread how? Okay. It's spread by uh, your, it's, it's spread as a, as a droplet. Okay. It's spread as a droplet. So what happens is um, you have, let's say cats. The cats, what they do is that the cat feces, okay, the cat feces, they harbor Toxoplasma gondii. Do you know how a lot of people, they have uh, cat litters in their house, yes or no? Okay. They, have a, they have cat litters in their house, right? Do, are we aware that, patient, that people have pets, uh, cats as pet and they have cat litters in their house, yes or no? Right, so they have cat litters in their house and those litter boxes, basically they are the source of infection. These are the litter box, these are the feces, and these are basically the toxoplasma cysts. Now, what happened? What happens is that these cysts, they can enter through your nose and go all the way to your brain. Now, Everyone who has a pet cat who, keep, who keeps a litter box in their house, do they get affected with, tox with toxoplasmosis? The answer is no. Who are the patients who will get affected with toxoplasmosis? Immunocompromised patients. Yes, and, and pregnant patients. Yeah, so, that, so that's what I'm trying to say over here. Now, what do you see? What will the patient come and tell you? First and foremost, the patient will come and tell you and, and, and complain to you about the signs symptoms of a space occupying lesion in the brain. Now, since we have all finished CNS, we know the signs symptoms of a space occupying lesion. What are the signs symptoms? First and foremost, the patients will have headache that are known as early morning headaches that will eventually keep on getting worse in the morning. Patients will have lethargy, vomiting associated with the headache. Patients can have seizures, yes, Patients can have seizures. And if there's a lesion in the brain, patients can have different signs symptoms according to which lobe of the brain it affects. For example, if it affects the frontal lobe, can we have personality changes, yes or no? If it affects the temporal lobe, can we have uh, hearing problems, yes or no? Okay. If it affects the occipital lobe, can we have um, vision problems? The answer is yes. If it affects the parietal lobe, can we have uh, Gerstmann syndrome? Yes or no? Uh, if it affects the dominant parietal cortex, then we can have Gerstmann. If it affects the non-dominant parietal, parietal cortex, then we, then we can have visuospatial syndrome. So that's basically all the things that can happen. Along with this, along with this, what there's another thing that that can happen are the ones in pregnant patients. In pregnant patients, patients are checked for these infections. These are known as torch infections. The T in torch stands for toxoplasmosis. 
these infections are very devastating, not only for the not, not only for the pregnant mother, but also for um, the child. So this causes congenital toxoplasmosis. If the mother is affected with toxoplasma, the mother can transmit the disease to the fetus, and this causes a triangle of symptoms in babies. These triangle of symptoms are known as number one, chorioretinitis. Okay, this is how I need you to remember this. Chorioretinitis, patients will have hydrocephalus and patients will have intracranial calcifications. This is congenital toxoplasmosis. Okay, I would rather have you guys remember the sign symptoms in the form of a triangle. One, two, and three. They will always mention these three sign symptoms together. Patients will have blurry vision, difficulty in seeing, chorioretinitis. Patients will have enlargement of the um, biparietal diameter, hydrocephalus. Patients will have on a CT, you will see that there is calcification, especially near the ventricle. So that's basically what you will see. What will you see in a patient of, uh, in an adult patient? In an adult patient, what you will see is that you will see a lesion of the CT scan. I'm going to show you the CT scan in one second. This is how it would look, look like. This is the this is the cranium with the cerebral hemispheres. And you will see lesions like this, ring enhancing lesions. Are, are we clear, yes or no? Okay. Can you guys tell me some differential diagnosis of ring enhancing lesions in the brain? Uh, have you guys are, I mean, ha have you guys heard of primary CNS lymphoma? Yes or no? Is that also, um, a ring enhancing lesion? The answer is yes. Okay. Primary CNS lymphoma is caused by which organism? Last chances, please. It's caused by? Anyone? Is it caused by Epstein Barr virus? Yes, sir. Epstein Barr virus. Is it caused by Epstein Barr virus or not? Yes. Okay. Good. Now, how do you treat this condition? How do you treat um, toxoplasma body? Oh, uh, uh, before this, I wanna talk about another thing over here. Patients will have another thing. They will have a heterophil antibody test. Okay, what is a heterophilic antibody? Heterophilic antibody. Does, this, does anyone know what a heterophil antibody is? Heterophil antibody. Does anyone know what a heterophil antibody is? Yes, a monospot test. What is a monospot test? Can anyone elaborate the, the heterophil antibody? What do you guys mean by monospot? What do you mean by, by a heterophil antibody? Okay. Uh, Dr. B, would you mind unmuting yourself and letting us know what you know about uh, the heterophil antibody? Or you can even use the chat box to let us know how which, whichever you prefer. So basically what I'm trying to say over here is heterophilic antibody is basically a type of reaction where you would see agglutination when you mix uh, when you mix the patient's blood with a blood of another mammal, especially the mammal all over here that we would choose as a sheep. There are some organisms that can cause positive heterophilic antibody or positive monospot test. The name of such organism is what? Epstein Barr virus, yes or no? Does Epstein Barr virus have a positive uh, heterophil and antibody? Yes. Okay. So, agglutination of the Epstein Barr virus, the blood with Epstein Barr virus will agglutinate with the blood of another mammal, especially sheep. But over here in heterophilic toxoplasma gondii, the heterophilic antibody test will be negative. Okay. This will be there will be a negative monospot test. So that's, so, that's the last piece of information you need to know. Now, that's all. Let's move on to the second one. Let's move on to uh, this one over here. This one is very easy to um, diagnose, right? This is 
Negleria Fowleri. Negleria Fowleri. Neg Negleria Fowleri is basically what we call as a free living amoeba. It's, it's called a free living amoeba. Okay. Yes, the test is negative. <clears throat> okay. Now, what is the diagnostic test? The diagnosis test is that we would do serology or biopsy, or basically we make the diagnosis with um, we make the diagnosis with the history physical examinations and the ring enhancing lesion. What is the treatment? I'll talk about the treatments of CNS infections in one second. Then let me just talk about uh, the transmission. I'm going to talk about the treatments as a whole. Okay. Are we clear? Yes or no? Yeah. Now, let's talk about Negrea fowleri. This is a free living amoeba. What happens over here is that this free living amoeba is basically, basically present in fresh water ponds. Okay. It's there in fresh water ponds. And who are the patients? The patients are the ones who goes for swimming in the freshwater ponds, okay? So, so that's that. Now, what, what are the signs and symptoms that will happen? So for example, let's say that this is the patient who's, un who's unaware of the, of the fatal disease that he's about to jump into. And then he does jump into it. He swims for however long as he wants, not being aware that he, not being aware that the parasite has entered his nose, okay, the parasite has entered his nose and through the nose, there's a plate over here. This is called, this is called what plate? Cribriform plate, yes or no? Through the cribriform plate, this parasite has entered his CNS, central nervous system, and it has spread all the way down through the meninges into the spinal cord and the CSF is affected, resulting in what we would call as parasitic meningo, meningoencephalitis encephalitis. Now, what are you going to see over here? What you're going to see is something like this. In the CSF, if you take the CSF fluid, obviously you're going to see the parasitic CSF. So what, so what does that mean? In the CSF, you're going to see that the opening pressure is high. You're going to see that the glucose is normal. Protein concentration is a little bit increased. And you are going to see a little bit of lymphocytosis. It's not, neutroph not neutrophilic leukocytosis. You, you are going to see lymphocytosis. And you can also see something like this in the CSF. These are the parasites that will be roaming around in the CSF. This is very nonspecific. Uh, this is a very nonspecific diagram. So that's that. But that's what you're going to see. And the worst part is, what is the fatality rate or the rate of fatality for uh, Negleria fowleri? Okay. Unfortunately, that's how fatal this, this disease is. The patients will die. There is a very small chance of survival. That is, if sometimes some patients have been known to respond to amphotericin D. This is a question in your step one exam. What, what would happen? What, what is the fate of a person who gets affected with Negleria fowleri and had they have meningoencephalitis? The fate is that there's a very high probability that they will not make it. But as a physician, is, is, is that what you're gonna say to the patient that you're probably not gonna make, that you're probably not gonna make it, yes or no? No, what you're gonna do is basically you're gonna, you, you are going to try your best to recover the patient. How? By treating them with amphotericin B, maintaining ABCs, intubations, ICUs, and all, and all of those things. So that's basically what it is. Let's move on to the last one. Okay. One of my favorite organisms. Okay. One of my favorite organisms because this is a Batman organism because this is Trypanosoma brutzi. Are we clear? Yes or no? Trypanosoma brutzi. What is Trypanosoma brutzi? Trypanosoma brutzi is basically a disease of trypanosomiasis. We call this, we call this African sleeping sickness. Okay. We call this African sleeping sickness. The reason why we would call this African sleeping sickness is because 
there was a time, not right now, this, this was named as F African sleeping sickness a while back, but there was a time when this disease was very profound and had a very high incidence and prevalence in Africa. What would happen over here? Patients would have signs symptoms of, um, patients would have sign symptoms of fever, enlarged lymph nodes, And they can also have CNS sign symptoms, meaning that they can have headache, seizures, and be called the sleeping sickness because patients would always be in a state of somnolence. Are we clear? Yes or no? Okay, now. The next thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna understand how this disease is being transmitted. Now, this is very difficult for me to draw. This disease is transmitted by a bug known as a tsetse fly. It's called a tsetse fly. Okay, this is a, this is a tsetse fly. Okay. This is a bug that will harvest this organism. Okay, I know, so, I know some of you are disgusted by bugs. I'm not gonna keep it here for a long time, but this is basically a tsetse fly. This is also called a kissing bug. So what this will do, why it's called a kissing bug, it's because it will come and it will sit on your skin and before it bites, it's, it's just gonna mope around with your skin a little bit. The, um, the reason why this was called kissing is, is because this will uh, start rubbing itself on your skin. And when it does pierce your skin with all the skin rubs, that this parasite will pierce and it will enter your skin. Now, this will enter your skin in the form of this. Okay in the form of this, this is what we call as a hypermastigal. Look at this. Are we clear? Yes or no? This is what we call as a hypermastigal. Okay. Are we clear? Yes or no? Everyone. Okay. Now, let's talk about the treatments. That's all about, that's all about the CNS uh, parasites. Let, let's, let's talk about the treatment. Treatment. Treatment for toxoplasmosis. Treatment for maglaria, we already know this. And treatment for trypanosomiasis. These are a little bit difficult to remember. First and foremost, if I ask you the treatment of protozoal infections, as a rule of thumb, they're all treated with metronidazoles, yes or no? Okay. I wish I could say the same for um, CNS protozoas, because CNS protozoas, they are not treated with, um, they're not treated with your, um, Metro, metronidazoles. What they are treated with is I'm, is I'm going to use certain mnemonics so that it's easy for you to remember. Okay. Now, what I need you guys to remember is something like this. Okay. This is toxoplasma. Okay. What I'm trying to draw over here is okay. it's a cat. The color of the cat is what? Yellow. And this is not an ordinary cat. This is a cat with a pirate's mask. Are we clear? Yes or no? What, what, what was the name of the Disney character of a pirate cat? There was a, there was a pirate cat, yes or no? Okay, let, me, let me show you guys. This one, yes. Are we clear, yes or no? A pirate cat, okay. With this, I need you to remember with the color of the sulfur. Is sulfur yellow, yes or no? Sulfur is yellow. Good. So with the yellow color of the cat, I need you to remember sulfur. With sulfur, we have sulfadiazine. Sulfur, diazine, and with the uh, 
cat as a pirate, I need you to remember as the, as the treatment as pyrimethamine. Are we clear, yes or no? Okay. And cat for obviously the fact that cats are the one that harvests the pomegranate only. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Nagleria fowleri, we already know the treatment. This is amphotericin D. Trypanosome, okay. Now let's, let's talk about trypanosome, okay. Now this is gonna sound a little bit silly, but what do we do when, uh, or what do Muslims do when they fall in trouble? Do they recite surahs, yes or no? Praise. Yes or no? Okay. What do okay? So let's let's talk about a Muslim brother who got affected with trypanosomies, with trypanosomiasis. Now, what he's gonna do is he's gonna recite surahs. Surahs for suramen. Are we clear? Yes or no? Surahs. Surahs are basically dialects from the Holy Quran. Okay? These are basically dialects and verses of the Holy Book. Are we clear? Okay. The reason why I am, I'm coming up with mnemonics is because I know that you guys will learn the treatment and it will take you guys, let's say, five minutes to learn the treatment and it will take you two minutes to forget the treatment. Okay? Because that's how difficult and um, that's how um, it's very important. That's why I'm, I'm, uh, that's why I'm, uh, I'm actually putting some effort into this. If it wasn't, then I would have just asked you guys to remember this by yourself. But this is actually pretty widely tested. The treatment for Toxoplasma gondii is not very easily remembered. The people who are responsible for making questions, they're aware of this. And they try to separate good students from uh, better students. So is the treatment for um, trypanosomiasis that is with treated with so with suramen. There was, however, one other drug that you we used to use in the past for treating um, uh, trypanosomas, but we do not use it right now because of high adverse effects. This drug is known as melasopro. Melasopro, okay. For a very high yield. If you can remember suramen, that's enough. Okay. Are we clear? Yes or no? Now, with that, we are done with CNS parasites. Okay. Let's move on to the next one. Let's move on to um, let's move on to the next one. That is heme or parasites in the blood. What were the two words for heme? Parasites, please. They were E B. Very good. Okay. First one. First P is one of the most highest yield P's and it's basically um, the king of all parasites. This is the emperor of all, it is the emperor of parasitic world. Uh, this is Plasmodium, very famous, yes or no? Yeah. Responsible for causing what? Plasmodiums, responsible for causing malaria. Okay. Now, how many types of plasmodium do we have? I'm pretty sure we all know this or else we would not be able to pass our uh, previous exams, right? Plasmodium vivax, plasmodium ovale, plasmodium falciform, plasmodium falciform, and plasmodium malaria. These are the four types of Plasmodium. Now, what is basically uh, plasmodium? Plasmodium is basically a parasite that is harvested in, or that is kept as a, as a reservoir, and it's transmitted by a vector known as the female, okay, Anopheles mosquito. This is known as a female. Anopheles mosquito. The, what they do is uh, they take the organism, the organism sort of completes its life cycle inside the mosquito. And when the mosquito bites, it 
um, puts the organism and the organism goes through the blood, resulting in the sign symptoms, which are patients will have fever. Now let's talk about this fever. This is no ordinary fever. This is the fever of malaria. This, these fevers, they will differ according to the organism which has been put into the blood. There are these, these fevers, they could be either tertian fevers. What do we mean as tertian? That is, they will come and go every 48 hours. Okay. Then, then this fever could be quartan fevers that can come and go every 72 hours. And there could be another one, which, which are irregular fevers. That is, they do not follow any timeline. If it's a tertian fever, we would like to imagine the parasite to be as either Vivex or Ovali, right? Over here. If it's a quartan fever, very simply put, we would like to imagine the organism to be a malaria. That is this one over here. And if it's an irregular fever, we would like to imagine the organism to be a falciparum, a simple type. Now, from all of this, tertian, quartan, and irregular, this is the one to look out for. Why? This is the one to look out for because if it's an irregular fever, if it does not follow any timeline, so one second, please let the man have fun in his car by listening to music. Yeah. Thank you. So this is the one to look out for. So this is a, so these are the patients who will come to you with irregular fever. And this is difficult for the patient because these patients, they are at risk of having cerebral malaria. What is cerebral, what is cerebral malaria? That plasmodium falciparum is the only type of plasmodium that will accumulate and that will clog the blood vessels. Are we clear, yes or no? So when the blood tries to pass through, it, it cannot pass through this, resulting in widespread ischemias in the brain, kidneys, lungs. Are we clear, yes or no? Patients will have sign symptoms of pulmonary embolism. Patients can have sign symptoms of acute tubular necrosis. Patients can have sign symptoms of stroke, is ischemic stroke. Okay. That's it. Okay. So that's basically what I'm trying to say over here. Um, <clears throat> another thing that I, that I want to talk about this is one second. Okay. Now, another thing that, that I want to talk about is that the plasmodium vivex, okay, the plasmodium vivex, they have a tendency of, okay, the plasmodium vivex, they have a tendency of staying in the liver as a dormant form. This dormant form is known as hypnozoic. Hypnozoic. Okay. They have a dormant form for staying in the liver and the form of a hypnozoid. And uh, over here, the problem is this. If they stay in the liver as a hypnozoid, patients can get recurrent infections. The only piece of information you need to know is that Vivex and uh, Ovali, they can remain as hypnozoids, but falciparum and, mal and Mallory, they do not form hypnozoids, meaning that they do not stay dormant in the liver. Now, why is this clinically important? This is clinically important because when we want to treat patients, do we also want to cover the hypnozoids in the liver? Yes or no? Okay. Do we also want to uh, cover the uh, cover the hypnozoids? The answer is yes. So we use a drug Okay, I'll, I'll talk about this in details. We'll use a drug called mefloquine, okay, especially, especially mefloquine. And we will prolong the treatment for, with mefloquine. For example, we can use a lot of different types of drugs. We can use chloroquine, we can use mefloquine, we have uh, progueno, quinidine, uh, uh, Ardestonate and, and Lumifantrin, and these are all the names of the anti-malarial drugs, but this is one drug 
which we should continue for four more weeks after a patient has been treated, especially if they have come from a zone that is highly endemic for vibrant central valleys. This will cover the liver hypnozoids. Okay. Are we clear, yes or no? Yeah. How, how do you diagnose malaria? Diagnosis of malaria is um, not that difficult. What we do is we do a blood smear. Right? We do a blood smear. And then what do we see in the blood smear? When in the blood smear, we see RBCs, right? These are RBCs with the malarial rings. Okay. These are the malarial rings inside the RBC. So that's how you diagnose it. That's that. Another thing is um, there is another form. This is basically a uh, trophozoidic ring. Trophozoid. Malaria, they have another form which they can take. This is known as this is known as a skid joint form, where they form a lot of dots. These are known as Schaffner's dots, okay. or Schaffner's stippling. Okay, these can also be seen in inside the RBCs. Are we clear? Yes or no? <clears throat> okay. Now these are more commonly seen with Vivex and Ovali. And troph trophozoidic ring are seen in Vivex, Ovali, Falciparum, and the malaria. That's a perfect. Okay. So that's that. Um, so let's talk about the treatment. Okay. I'm just taking things a little bit slow because I do not want you guys to get overwhelmed with all of this information over here. Let's take things slow one or one step at a time. Let's, let's talk about the treatment right now. Okay. Treatment, let's talk about this. <clears throat> First and foremost, the drug that was prescribed by uh, our previous president for the treatment of coronavirus, right? The famous drug, okay? Hydroxychloroquine, okay? He was so sure that hydroxychloroquine would treat coronavirus that even scientists were a little bit confused and worried that how could a president have time to figure out or go through researchers to find out the connection between plasmodiums and COVID. So unfortunately, this, this does not yield a lot of importance in the treatment of coronavirus, okay, obviously, but in the treatment of malaria, it's still the staple drug, the number one for sensitivity. But for its widespread use nowadays, hydroxychloroquine has been a little bit resistant. So what we do is that we try to map the patient to recovery, okay? If hydroxychloroquine doesn't work, for resistant patient, we map, we give them a map so that they can follow the map to recovery. With map, what do we have? We have mefloquine, A, we have atovaquam. Okay. With T, we have proguano. Proguano. Are we clear? Yes or no? No. If it's a cerebral, are we clear about this? The treatment? No. If it's a cerebral malaria, if it's a cerebral malaria for um, your treatment purpose, it's a life-threatening disease. So we would want to prescribe a drug that will rapidly work and try to kill the plasmodiums. In that case, we would like to prescribe intravenous quinidine or artisanal. and lumefantin. Okay. 
Okay. Are we clear? Yes or no? So that's all we need to know for this one. Okay. What are the drugs you can use for profile access for malaria? For example, let's say someone goes to a malaria endemic zone. What are you going to give them? Last answers, please. Anyone? Does anyone know the, the answer to this? What are you going to give to a patient? There you go. Okay. You can give them, nowadays we choose mefloquine, which is a quinine group of drugs. Previously, we used to give chloroquine. And sometimes we would also like to give primaquine. Right? So that this one covers the organisms in the blood. And primaquine has been shown to affect the hypnozoids in the liver. So that's that. Okay. Okay. So that's all we need to know from the teams. Okay. Let's go to the next one. Let's go to the next one. Let's go to P. We're, we're, we're done with P. Now let's go to B. Okay. B4, Babesia, Microdic. Okay. What is, what is Babesia? Babesia is responsible for causing a disease that is known as Babesiosis. Okay. It's a pretty rare disease, but we cannot um, throw it off. The reason being is because Babesia, like its counterparts, Borrelia, which is a bacteria, Anaplasma, and Arlichia, all of these, they have one thing in common, okay? The one thing common to all of this is exodus tick. So Babesia is basically a parasite that is transmitted by exodus tick. When the uh, Babesia is transmitted by the exodus tick, what happens is um, patients, they have certain sign symptoms, which are the sign symptoms of fever and the sign symptoms of hemolytic anemia. Now, I'm pretty sure you guys are aware of the question I'm gonna ask right now. The questions are going to be about hemolytic anemia. Okay, so let's talk about this. What would happen to the hemoglobin and hemolytic anemia, high or low? Low, okay. What would happen to the uh, to the reticular site count, high or low? High. What would happen to the LDH, lactic dehydrogenase? High. What would happen to um, are you going to see more yellowish urine? Yes or no? Hemoglobin urea. Yes. Okay. Does anyone else want to want to contribute what we will find in hemolytic anemia? Another thing that we can find in hemolytic anemia, what would happen to haptoglobin? Haptoglobin should be high or low, low haptoglobin. Okay. So that's that. Along with that, we will also have, obviously we will have jaundice. So that's basically what we're, what, what we're gonna see in a patient of Babesia. Along with this, okay we're gonna think that the patient might have some sort of a hemolytic anemia, but all the causes of hemolytic anemia, for example, paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, GCSPD deficiency, right? And all of those, those other conditions, do they come with fever? Yes or no? Heredity, pheocytosis, zeocytosis, no. If we have a patient of hemolytic anemia and the patient also has fever, can you make a provisional diagnosis of Babesia, especially if the patient is coming from states such as um, New York, New Jersey, Colorado, my apologies, uh, Connecticut, Pennsylvania. Yes or no? Can you make the diagnosis, a provisional diagnosis that the patient could have Babesia? So what are you going to do? You're, you're going to draw blood. And when you draw blood, what are you going to see? 
Okay, you're going to see something that looks like this. Okay, before I draw it any better. It's called a Maltese cross. This this sort of this sort of pattern. Okay. So you will see something that looks like this. Uh, are we clear? Yes or no? This is called a Maltese cross pattern. Okay. How are you going to diagnose this? You can diagnose this, you can diagnose a patient like this, or sometimes, sometimes some hospitals would like to do a PCR to confirm the diagnosis. How do you treat this condition? Babesia with a tovaquan and as it. If you cannot remember this one, at least remember this one, uh, azithromycin. Are we clear, yes or no? Everyone? Okay. okay. Now, before I begin the visceral protozoal organisms, can I give you guys five minutes to revise so that we can um, do a quick revision and recapitulation because we're going to be done with protozoas in one minute. because we only have the last one, the visceral protozoans, and then after that, we're gonna be done. Thank you. How long do you guys need to revise the GI, CNS, and heme protozoans? Five minutes or more? Can I get some feedbacks, please? How long do you guys need to revise the protozoans? 10 minutes. Okay, so I'm going to give you guys 10 minutes because what I want to do is, since I have provided so many informations over here, I do not want you guys to get a look, get overwhelmed <clears throat> and mix all of this information up. So let me give you guys 10 minutes. In these 10 minutes, please try to revise the GI heme and the um, CNS protozoans. And then after that, we'll start talking about the visceral protozoans. Okay, thank you so much.
So, <clears throat> is everyone done? Yes or no? Okay. Did, did you guys really revise in the last 10 minutes or just took a break and watched a YouTube video? Which one? Revise. Okay, good. So you guys are more mature than I was. I would have most probably taken this break to watch something. Okay, good. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Uh, you have a patient who comes to you with a history of camping with cramping abdominal pain, foul smelling diarrhea. First provisional diagnosis is GIA. Patients come to you with fever, diarrhea, with bloody diarrhea, with uh, right upper quadrant pain. Diagnosis and Tamiba. Patient comes to you with severe diarrhea and AIDS. Diagnosis. Patient comes to you with multiple ring enhancing lesion with a negative monospot test. Patient comes to you with meningoencephalitis with a history of swimming in a freshwater pond. Patient comes to you with a history of fever, lymph node enlargement, coma, somnolence. Diagnosis? TB. Very good. Patient comes to you with fever, lethargy, weakness every 48 hours. What is your diagnosis? 5X. Patient comes to you with fever, hemolytic anemia. What is your diagnosis? Baby. It's not baby. It's, it's baby she is. is. Okay. okay, good. Okay. Babe, babes, baby. Okay. That's all that. it's babesia. It's babesias, babesiosis or babesia microbial. Okay. Okay. Now, okay. Let's begin with the last one. Is everyone ready? Yes or no? I apologize for going a little bit slow today. <clears throat> Just feeling a little bit under the weather, but I appreciate you guys for having your attention in the lecture. So let's let's do the last one. Just give me one second, please. Okay, let's begin with the last one. <clears throat> let's begin with uh, visceral infections. You just got your results and you passed your MBME. Very good, okay. Congratulations. Um, which MBME did you do well in? The one for school, very good, okay. Very good. Okay. Good job, okay. thank you so much for sharing that information, from, for motivating us all to do the same and to follow in your footsteps and do well in our NBMEs. Okay, good. Now, um, with that being said, can we come back? To the visceral organisms, yes or no? Good, very good. Okay. Uh, once again, thank you so much, Dr. B, for sharing that information. Hope that motivates us all to do well in our NDMAs and um, keep on doing the good work. And now let's keep, let's put our attention back to the visceral infections. With visceral infections, we have the first one. This is another one of my favorite. This is Trypanosoma cruzi. Okay. This is my favorite because this parasite will dilate all organs. 
with that means the most famous question is that which organism is responsible for echolasia? Which organism is responsible for dilated cardiomyopathy? If there is any organism that can cause dilatations, it's called trypanosoma cruzi. Are we clear? Yes or no? No. Now, how do we have trypanosoma cruzi? Trypanosoma cruzi is spread by a bug. This is known as a triatom bug. Triatom. Okay. Triatom bug. And what happens is that this triatom bug, this is also a kissing bug. Okay. What do we mean by kissing bug? Kissing bugs are basically called bugs which will come and sit on your skin and it will mope around. This one, however, has a more perverted has a more perverted approach to the spread of the organism, perverted in the sense I'm going to tell you how, is that the first thing the bug is going to do is it will come and it will sit on your skin. And after making love to your skin, that is kissing your skin, it will defecate on your skin or it will poo on your skin. Are we clear? Yes or no? Now that defecation will harvest the organism of trypanosoma cruzi and that trypanosoma cruzi will enter your blood through the feces of the triatom bug. Are we clear? Yes or no? No. no. How do they look like, all the trypanosoma cruzis? So first and foremost, how, what, what will the patient come and complain to you about? The patient will come and complain to you about multiple constellation of signs symptoms. The clinical features are going to be about, if it's a dilatation of the esophagus, they can have dysphagia, okay? They can have, um, they can have megacolon, okay? And another one, is that this bug can go and affect your eyes, resulting in a sign called as Romania sign. So you will have unilateral eye swelling. Okay, you will have unilateral eye swelling. Now, when a patient comes to you with uh, dysphagia, achalasia, megacolon, eye swelling with, um, insect bites on the hand, what are you gonna do? You're gonna <clears throat> try to take the blood of the patient. And in the blood, what will you see? You will see, once again, the same trypomasticle. Are we clear, yes or no? This is the trypomasticle that we saw for trypanosoma bootsy. Are we clear about this? Yes, okay, good. Okay. Once again, <clears throat> where did we use a gun for the treatment? The nitrous gun, nitrous oxide. Where did we use the nitrous oxide gun? Very good. Okay. This one. Is also killed by this guy over here, okay? So this is your, this is your trypanosoma cruzi. And this is the assassin with a gun, okay? Who will shoot the trypanosoma cruzi? This guy is driving a Mercedes Benz. Okay, let me just do this. It's a Mercedes Benz car with a gun. With Mercedes Benz, you have Benz Nidazole. And with the gun, the nitrous gun, with this, you have Nifertimox. Are we clear? Yes or no? 
Okay. This is how you remember the name of the drugs that you can use for trypanosomiasis. Okay, now let's move on to the next one. <clears throat> let's move on to the next one that is Leishmania. Visceral, visceral protozoa, Leishmania. Okay, Leishmania donovani is responsible for causing what we would say as visceral leishmaniasis or cutaneous leishmaniasis. Visceral and cutaneous leishmaniasis, these are basically very well-known diseases to us because um, this is very high yield in third world countries, Southeast Asian countries, and on all of those regions where this parasite is transmitted by this bug. This is called a sandfly. This is called a sandfly. These flies are more harvested and are more present in, in houses that are made of um, what I would say is mud house. Yes or no? Mud houses. Okay. Now, what happens is that when the sand fly, when it bites your skin, the organisms, they enter your skin. And after they enter your skin, they cause a constellation of sign symptoms that are known as fevers, along with hepatosplenomegaly, pancytopenia. Okay. Does it remind you of leukemia? Yes. Okay. So, fever, hepatosplenomegaly, pancytopenia. Leukemia. So what do you do when a patient comes to you with fever, hepatosplenomegaly, pancytopenia? Okay, obviously you do a constellation of, I mean, my apologies. Obviously you do, you run some, some blood tests. You do CBCs over there. You find, you find the blood counts are low. You're afraid the patient might have leukemia because the patient, let's say, doesn't give you a very detailed history. The next thing you do is you do a peripheral blood smear or a peripheral blood film. And when you do do that, you find something like this you find a macrophage that is filled with these sorts of cysts or amnesticots. Now, this is the third type of organism that is harvested inside a macrophage. Number one was brucella, yes or no? Number two was, which one? Which we studied yesterday, fungi. Esoplasma. Number three is Leishmania. Are we clear? Yes or no? And what if there is a tissue paper appearance of the macrophage? Then what do we call the disease? Gaucher's disease. Very good. Okay. Then we would like to call this as Gaucher's disease. How do you um, treat Leishmania? You treat Leishmania with amphotericin D and you treat it with sodium stable gluconin. Thank you. I'm not going to use any mnemonic for this one because this is very specific and um, this is very easy to remember. You'll see when you see a question and if you see sodium steboglucanate, I'm very sure that it will strike in your mind that this is the treatment for leishmaniasis. I know, I know for a fact that students forget benzmidazole and nifertimox. That's the reason why we have the mnemonic over here and not for this one. Okay, okay so that's all about um, leishmania donoveni. Let's move on to the last one for the protozoas after which we will be done with protozoas. Last one, trichomonas. Responsible for causing vaginitis. Parasitic vaginitis. Yesterday we learned about another type of uh, vaginitis or vaginosis. That was bacterial vaginosis. The organism was Gardnerella vaginalis, right? Where we had two cells. Do you guys remember this? And there was a very distinctive, distinctive fishy smell. Yes or no? This one over here 
will not have a fishy smell. These patients, however, will have an unfortunate foul smell, which they'll complain of. If you ask them if, if the smell it has, a, has, a, has a fishy vibe to it, they will obviously say no. This, um, this basically smells like, um, smells like anything which they have never smelled before. That's how bad this is. And the worst part is that it's very unfortunate for the patients because there will be extreme amount of pain, itching, burning around the genital area. Is this a transmitted disease, sexually transmitted disease? The answer is yes. Meaning that if the husband, I mean, if the spouse has the disease, I mean, if the wife has the disease, the husband or another partner of the spouse or another partner of the patient can also have the disease. So you will have to treat two people at the same time. Okay. So that's basically what it is. Um, you world would like to use a color for the discharge. The color for the discharge is greenish discharge. Okay, that would happen over here. What do you see? When patients come to you and they complain to you about pain, itching, burning sensations, and foul smelling in the female, uh, I mean, in the genital tract, the next thing that you do is you run a wet mount test. Okay, you run a wet mount test. Before you do that, you ask um, for a PV examination. Okay. You, in a PV examination or per vaginal examination, what do you see? You see a cervix that looks like a strawberry, strawberry cervix, meaning that there is inflammation. You know how we get um, the signs of the five signs symptoms of inflammation, right? Ruber, collar, dollar, uh, ruber, collar, dollar, and uh, functional visa and tumor. So you would see all of those things in the form of a strawberry cervix. Then you take a little bit of the fluid and then you run it under wet mount in a saline microscope and you see something like this. This kite, this kite-like appearance with a single eye or a nucleus, however you wanna call this in the middle. This is the organism, Trichomonas. How do you treat this organism? The treatment is very simple. First of all, you treat both the patient and the patient's partner with metronidazole. Okay. And you advise them to um, not practice sexual intercourse for at least four weeks. Okay. Three to four weeks. Are we clear? Yes or no? Very direct. This is a very direct question. Um, the most common questions you receive from this one is uh, the name of the organism and if they want to take it up or not, they'll ask you about the treatment. Okay, that's what it is. Okay. Now, with that being said, we're done with nematodes. Okay, we're done with nematodes. Let's, uh, let's come over here. My apologies. With, with that being said, we're done with protozoas. Now we'll begin with nematodes. My concentration is just all over the place today, I apologize. Now, let's begin with nematodes. Is everyone ready? Yes or no? Yes, okay. Let's begin with nematodes. Oh. Nematodes. Basically, when we talk about nematodes, there are certain types of nematodes. Once again, according to uh, the mode of transmission, we will learn them. And by the mode of transmission, uh, not only will we learn the nematodes, we will also learn the nematodes according to their area of, of harvest. For example, if I say fecal oral, that means that they are going to affect your GI tract, meaning nematodes that are transmitted by ingestion. Then if I tell you that there are nematodes that will affect your skin, that means that nematodes are entering via skin piercing, meaning cutaneous. Another one is um, these ones, they will, they will not pierce your skin, but bite your skin. So these are bites. So these are the key ways that enter. Number one, when we say ingested, the organisms I need you to remember are with E, A, T, 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 
T. Eat. With cutaneous, I need you to remember sand. Okay. With bite, I need you to remember low. Okay. Are we clear? Yes or no? Okay. Let's begin. Let's begin with the first one, ingesting. Okay. With ingested organism, we have E, A, T, T, and T. With that being said, E, the first one is enterobias vermicularis. Okay. Enterobias vermicularis. Now, this organism is spread especially via fecal oral route. What happens is that uh, they survive in the intestines. They are not degraded by the intestinal uh, acids and enzymes that survive. And when they are passed out through the feces, this is basically the anal canal. Okay. While they're passed out through the feces, some of them will have the tendency of sticking to the mucous membrane or the skin of the anal canal like this. And their squirming movement will cause severe anal pruritus. And this is especially common in babies. So when they have pruritus, obviously the babies, the response is to itch. And when they will itch, the organism will harvest in their fingers. And when they do not wash their fingers and they eat the food again, the organisms will again enter the GI tract. And the cycle continues. Are we clear? Yes or no? Patients will come to you about uh, which problem they'll come to you about severe anal pruritus. What do you do? You diagnose this how? First of all, from history. And another one is by physical examination. What examination do you do? You use a tape test. Very good. You use a tape test. In a tape test, what do you do? Um, you tape or you put something sticky in the walls or the skin of the anal canal. Then you take the tape out and you try to view it under a microscope. And what do you see? You see something that reminds you of another uh, organism. Okay? This is the organism. Okay. What does this one look like? This one, geodiasis cyst, except this one is for enterobias, for vermiculars. And this is called, this is, this is what we call as, um, <coughs> excuse me. This is, this is, this is called a uh, cyst of enterobias. So you visualize the cyst over there. So that's all you need to know for enterobias, vermiculars. Let's move on to the next one. Okay. Please don't focus on the treatments. We'll, we'll talk about the treatments later. Let's, let's talk about this one. The next A. The next A is for Ascariasis lumbricoides. Okay. Very high yield. Ascariasis lumbricoid is um, basically this is transmitted by a fecal oral route. When they are transmitted, they go from the GI tract to the liver. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> they go to the GI tract to the liver. And in the liver, what they do is um, they cause obstruction of the biliary tract. Okay. They cause obstruction of the biliary tract. As simple as that. Another thing that they do is that over here, they'll obviously cause fever. They'll obviously cause a little bit of a diarrhea and all of those signs of the abdominal cramps. And patients will have sign symptoms of malabsorption, fatty stool. Why? Because the bile is not being able to pass into the second part of the duodenum, yes or no? So will they have proper absorption of fat? The answer is no. And with this, uh, uh, what else do we see? Sometimes patients will also have anemia 
this anemia is normal static anemia. Yes or no? And if they start maturing, the scariest part is that these parasites, they can come out through your nose, sometimes even the eyes. Are we clear, yes or no? Okay. That's all you need to know about ascaricity. Do not, do not, um, please do not confuse ascaricity with ankylostoma. Okay. Ascaricity with ankylostoma. Why anemia? Sometimes ascaricity, they would try to survive by taking blood, meaning that they will start sucking blood, but the, suck, but the blood sucking mechanism is more high yield for ankylostoma duodenale, much less for ascaricity lumbifoids. So that's that. But sometimes we also see normal static anemia, not all the time. Let's talk about the next one. The next one is, um, oh, right, my apologies. Let me talk about the cysts. Very good. Diagnosis. How, how do you diagnose uh, ascaricis? We diagnose ascaricis by seeing the feces. Okay. My apologies for not mentioning this. The feces. In the feces, what do you see? You see the cysts. The cysts, which have an appearance of knobs. You know, like how we have door knobs, yes or no? Yes. This is known as knobby coating. Are we clear, yes or no? There will be knobs all around the cyst. This is known as a cyst of S cases. Let's talk about the next one. Let's talk about um, Toxocara. Okay. Toxocara canis. Is everyone ready? Yes or no? Okay. Let's talk about Toxocara canis. Toxocara canis is I need you to remember this car, okay? Car for myocarditis, okay? What happens is that toxocaracanus is basically a nematode that is spread by ingesting the organism, okay? So you ingest the organism and then the organism goes down <clears throat> and gets absorbed from your GI tract by bypasses the liver, then it enters your bloodstream, then it goes to different tissues. What are, what are the tissues that it can go for? Number one, it would try to go for the heart, resulting in severe myocarditis. Okay, they can also affect your liver, resulting in hepatitis. And for some reason, they also have a tendency to go to the eyes and causing severe visual impairment. Okay, are we clear? Yes or no? So <clears throat> can we imagine that this parasite is roaming around in your blood in a car, going to different spots? And um, you know, like what happens when we go to different vacation spots we go there, we're completely, obliv we're completely ob oblivious. Most of us will try to be as decent as possible and not make sure that we damage the place. But some people, they're not so considerate, so they will go to different vacation spots and they would trash the place, yes or no. For example, go to different Airbnbs and know that there's someone to look out for because they paid the cleaning fee so they can damage the place as much as they want. This is basically those type of people in the form of parasites called toxocaracanus. <clears throat> so they will, these parasites, they will take the car in your blood and they will go to different tissues in your body and cause widespread damage. Okay. Are we clear? Yes or no? So we're done with EAT. We have two more T's. Okay. We have two more teeth. Now, this one is for <clears throat> Trichinella spiralis. I 
Okay. Yeah, this is known as Twitch and Alice Pyralis. Can we take a small break before we talk about Twitch and Alice Pyralis? Yes, Anna. Can we take a break for 15 minutes? Thank you.
Okay, is everyone back from their break? Can you guys hear my voice? <clears throat> is everyone back from the break? Can you guys hear my voice? Yes or no? <clears throat> What is the name of the organism that can cause uh, severe anal pruritus? On PAPE tests, you find the same cysts as you would find in, in GRDI. Enterobias, very good. What is the name of the organism that can cause ileocecal obstruction? What is the name of the organism that takes a car, roams around your body, goes to different tissues? and causes different sorts of widespread damage. Toxocara, or a toxic car, yes or no? Now, we'll talk about another one. We'll talk about Trichinella spiralis. When I talk about this word, okay, when I talk about the word spiralis, does it um, make you remember of the spiral or the striated muscle fibers, yes or no, in the muscles? Okay. You know how the skeletal muscles, they're striated. Okay. They have a striated spiral appearance. Now, I, I want you to think about this word. And I want you to think about this muscle. And I need you to understand that when Tichinella spiralis is ingested, they go once again from your GI tract, escapes the liver and goes to your muscle. Are we clear, yes or no? They will go to your muscle. And what, what will they do in the muscle? In the muscles, they will cause severe, severe muscle inflammation. And patients will have debilitating myalgias. Yes or no? Along with this, patients will also have fever, <clears throat> myalgia, and also a little bit of diarrhea. Are we clear? Yes or no, everyone? That's all you need to know from Trichinella spiralis. Let's move on to the next one. Let's move on to this one. Trichurus or Trichurus, Trichura or Trichura. Okay. Now, <clears throat> this is the last one for the ingested. Thank you. What's happening over here? Trichurus trichura is basically a nematode that will affect your GI tract in a way that when they will go down, they will cause, they will cause severe trichurus trichura will cause treachery and treachery in the rectal region. What do we mean by the word treachery? Do we, is, is, is it the same uh, synonym as robbery or stealing? Yes or no? Yes or no? Okay. So I need you to remember this, that there will be treachery in the rectal region, meaning that this parasite, <clears throat> when it will affect, when it will leave the GI tract, it will steal some of the mucous membrane and it will pull it down. So it will cause treachery, treacherous, treachura will cause treachery in the rectal region, meaning that it will treachery, meaning that it will rob some of the mucous membrane of the rectal region and it will go down. What do we call this condition if a uh, part of the rectum comes down? do we call this prolapse? We call this prolapse. Rectal prolapse. Okay, are we clear? Yes or no? That's all you need to know about Pritchard's Pritchard. We're done with the nematodes, uh, the ingested form of the nematodes. Let's go to the second one, the cutaneous nematodes. Now, what were the letters that I needed you to remember for Cutaneous nematodes. Sand. Okay. Uh, 
the first one is strongyloid starkularis. Okay. Or we call this strongyloidosis, strongyloid starkularis. When I say cutaneous, what do I mean? I mean that their mode of transmission is not through the fecal oral route, it's rather by cutaneous, meaning by the skin, as simple as that. So what happens when they enter the skin? How do they enter the skin? First and foremost, um, they enter um, the bloodstream through the skin by biting through the mucous membrane in the form of this one, in the form of a rabbitiform larva. Now, what do you need to know about this word rabbitiform? Okay, this word rabbitiform is, is arrived is derived from the same uh, word of rabos, or uh, this is, I'm not sure if it's a Greek or a Latin word, but this was the same word that was used to make the word rabies. Now, what does it mean? This means that this is a form of an organism where the organism is very fierce. Why, why, is, why are we calling this larva as a fierce food larva? Because they have developed certain sharp features that will allow this larva to bite and enter the bloodstream. Are we clear? Yes or no? This is how you remember this. This is a question in your step one exam. What is the form by which the organism enters? It's a rabbitiform larva. Now it will be easier for you to remember the word rabbitiform, yes or no, arrive from the same word rabos that can give rise to rabbitiform or also it's also given to the word um, to the, uh, the disease that is rabies. Yes, okay. So what happens that when they enter into your blood, okay, they enter it into the blood and um, what they do is that they go to the intestines. Okay. They go to the intestine and they stick there, sucking the blood from your intestinal wall, resulting in severe anemia. Are we clear? Yes or no? Okay. So that's it. That's all you need to know about strong blood circulars. And this is the only thing that is um, high yield. The organism will later leave, okay? The, the organism will later leave through the feces and it will stay on bare ground, especially for uh, US, the patients will have a history of walking barefoot in the past uh, one or two weeks. And uh, where do people walk barefoot in the U.S.? Beaches. Very good. <clears throat> okay. That's simple as that. If I ask you, where do people walk barefoot in uh, Southeast Asian countries? What would be your answer? Let's say farms. Yes or no? Yes. Okay. And. If there is a farmer who walks barefoot on a farm now comes to you with um, conjunctival injection, rash, jaundice, increased ALT, and creatinine, what, what is your diagnosis? This is easy. Very good. Let's talk about the second one. So we're done with the first S, then the next one is A, A4, A duodenally, or ankylostoma duodenally. Okay. What is ankylostoma duodenale? Ankylostoma duodenale also has the same, uh, another subspecies, which that is Nectar Americans. Okay, Nectar Americanus. Nectar Americanus or Nectar Americans. They have the same mode of transmission. What is the mode of transmission? One, one more time. Okay. Abditiform larva. They will. Um, enter into the skin by piercing the skin. And from the skin and the, and the blood vessels, these larvae, they will go to different parts of your body. And what this will do is that when they migrate 
they will leave a rash. This rash is what we call a snake rash or a serpentious rash. Serpentious or a serpentious rash. Now, are they pruritic? Are they itching? If the answer is yes. Okay. Now, what else, do, what else will they do? When they will go to the intestines one more time, they will also cause anemia. This time, it will be a microcytic anemia. Okay. Why? The answer is because these organisms, they have a, they have a more tendency of absorbing iron than, the, um, than blood itself. So serpentious rash and anemia. Another thing that they will cause is um, sometimes they can um, also go to the lungs okay, and cause severe hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Okay. Are we clear? Yes or no? So that's all you need to know about ankylostoma duodenum. Let me just show you this. This uh, serpentious lesion is called a cutaneous larva migraines. Does this look like a snake? Yes or no? A snake-like rash. It's as if a snake is moving. Yes or no? This is the mode of movement of the parasite. Okay. Moving all the way like this and this is causing the itching, yeah, something like that. Okay. So that's all you need to know about Ankylostoma duodenale and um, nectar americansis. So with that being said, we're done with SAM. Now let's go to the last one. <clears throat> okay. How are we doing in terms of understanding the lecture for today? Uh, are we going a little bit slower than usual? Is the pace of the lecture okay? Are we understanding the lecture? Yes or no? It's okay. Good. Now, let's go to the last one, bites. With bites, we have what? Low? Okay. First one. Are we ready for the bites? Yes or no? Okay. First one is called Loa Loa. Do you know what happens when you see, uh, for example, let's say this is the eye, right? If you see a worm in the eye, Okay, let's say you go in front of a mirror, right? This is the this is the mirror. Your eyes are itching. You stand in front of the mirror, and you see there's a worm that's moving in your eye. You scream out. Okay, you scream out. No, no, or this sounds like low, low. Okay. My, my apologies for being immature, but whatever helps you remember that loa loa will cause warming of conjunctiva, okay? Severe conjunctivitis. Are we clear, yes or no? Yeah. So this is the first one, loa loa. That's all you need to know. Uh, loa loa, if there's another thing that we need to know is basically the treatment, we'll talk about that later. And uh, the vector, the vector for loa loa are flies. These are called deer flies. They don't ask you this. I'm just writing this for the sake of writing it. It's also called a house fly. Sometimes it's also called a mango fly. I think these are not very common, especially in the US. Maybe a, a, a part, a very niche population of patients who likes to go camping would be the patients who would come to you with loa loa or warm and conjunctiva. Next one is onchocharchiasis or oncocharca volvularis. This is oncocharca volvularis. Now, very easy to remember. Okay. 
Um, <clears throat> let's say there's a cave. Okay. This is a cave. The cave is the cave's known. The, the, uh, the name of the cave is on on code. Caves are dark, yes or no? Okay. Caves are usually dark. Okay. So with Onko, I need you to remember the word black. Okay. Now with black, what do you have? The, <clears throat> these are especially spread by a type of vector known as a female black fly. Okay. Female, black, white. So this is the first black. Next one. Next one is um, what will they do? They will go to your eyes once again, multiply, resulting in black vision or blindness. Okay. And the last black that I need you to remember is that they can cause a nodule, which is what in color? Black in color, it's a black nodule. This nodule is basically the nodule which represents the bite from the female black fly. Are we clear everyone, yes or no? Okay. This is this is this blindness is sometimes called river blindness because oncocharcasis this is found near rivers because female black flies for example do you guys remember seeing uh, national uh, national geographic or TLC sometimes they would show polluted rivers with a lot of flies on top of them yes or no yes okay good so female black fly is one of those flies that would that would roam around a polluted liver uh, a polluted river. And when you walk around that, the female black fly will pierce your skin and transmit the infection. So that's it. The last one that I need you to remember is Usheria bancrofti. Now, how many of us have seen a patient of elephantasis? Elephantasis. Okay. How about, yes, Dr. Trisha, of course. Okay. Dr. Hussein. Okay, good. Okay. So from where, from where we are from, especially um, from where we are from, I can uh, relate to this with Dr. Trisha over here because we're from the same country. We are very aware of Wusheria bancrofti, that is spread by, an, or by a vector, which is a female, again, a female, Okay. okay, this is that's that's on me. That's just the first day thing. I'm not sure why they why they have to why they have to specify this. Okay, they could have just said a mosquito. Do you really care if it's a male or a female mosquito? No, your your problem is the disease. You have to treat the disease. So every time, I'm not I'm not really sure why they have to specify the sex of the uh, mosquito. So however, this is another female mosquito <clears throat> that is responsible for causing a very devastating disease. What happens is that when the mosquito bites it leaves off Usheria organism in your blood. And this organism will go all the way to your lymphatics. And they will block your lymphatics, resulting in lymphatic obstruction. As a result, the most amount of, the most amount of lymphatic drainage that happens in a very difficult way are the one from your legs, yes or no? Because they have to travel all the way up against gravity to get pumped. So that's that. Okay. So this is basically a leg of a patient who has lymphatic obstruction by Wuxeria bancrofti. All of this lymphatic accumulation over here would result in severe lymphatic edema, or we call this lymphedema. Like I'm not sure if you have ever seen a patient of lymphedema, the swelling is a very hard swelling. It will not be 
um, sweating where you will have pitting edema for like the one that we get in heart failure or right heart failure. It won't be like that. It won't be the one, it will be the one with accumulation of lymph because lymph is a very rich fluid which is high, which is very rich in protein and other uh, macronutrients. And what happens is that when there's, when the fluid is accumulated in the lymphatics for a long period of time, the water is absorbed. So all you are left behind is nothing but solute. And you have severe hardening swelling resulting in what we would call as elephantiasis. Let me show you a picture of elephantiasis. Oops. Okay. Are we clear? Yes or no? This is elephantiasis. Okay. Fascinating or not? Yes or no? Pretty fascinating. Very devastating for the patient nonetheless, but all in all, fascinating, fascinating therapy. Okay. So with that being said, we're done with nematodes. Okay. Quick revision and recapitulation. Please name the organism which can cause severe anal pruritus. Enterobios. Please name the organism that can cause um, ileocecal obstruction. Very good. Please name the organism that takes a toxic car to roam around your entire body, resulting in myocarditis, encephalitis, hepatitis. Toxocar. Please name the organism that will cause severe myalgia for its spiral nature. Trichinella. Please name the organism that can cause, um, what am I forgetting over here? That can cause treachery in the rectal region. Trichula is trichula. Please name the organism that can cause um, that can bite through your skin and um, it can cause auto infection and it will um, bite the wall of the intestines resulting in anemia, normocytic anemia. It's a pretty strong organism for strong goloidosis. Please name the organisms with A and N that can also pierce through your skin, cause microcytic anemia, serpentous rash, and sometimes Loeffler syndrome. Loeffler syndrome is hypersensitivity to the parasite group. Now, please name the organism after which you go in front of the mirror and you scream, no, 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 for low, low. Please name the organism which causes blackening of everything. Blindness, black nodule, oncocyte. Please name the organism that can cause elephantiasis spread by a female black fly. The first word is with a W, that is Boucheria. Very good. Now let's talk about the treatment. What is the difference between diarrhea and loose stool? Diarrhea has a more watery consistency. The stool osmolarity of diarrhea will be uh, lower. The stool osmolarity of loose stool is going to be a bit higher, but all in all, the consistency of the loose stool will have more fecal content than water. Are we clear, yes or no? You can differentiate them based on osmolarity. What is the normal osmolarity of the stool? The normal osmolarity of the stool is what? Anyone? Same as blood, thank you so much. I think I mentioned this once, right? What is the normal osmolarity of the blood? 295 to anyone? Osmolarity, not pH, osmolarity. Anyone? Anyone, osmolarity of the blood, come on. If you do not know the osmolarity of the blood, how do you differentiate? Yes, very good. 295 to 300 or 315, okay? Plus minus 20 here and there. So 295 to 315, milli or small per liter. Okay, good. 
Now, are we ready to start talking about um, the treatment? Okay. Treatment, enter B as vermiculitis with a B. Ascaris is B. Okay, look how easy this is. Fritura is uh, Fritura, B. Cuchinella spiralis, B, okay. And the last one, this is Toxocara, also with a B, okay. Okay, Dr. B, would you happen to know what this B stands for? Okay, very good. Okay. So, thank you so much. So this B is for bendazzles, very good. All of this, as a rule of thumb, every nematode can be treated with albendazole, mebendazole, okay, albendazoles. How do they work? We'll talk about this later, but very quickly, what, what, what they do is that they prevent the migration of um, the parasites, how? They disrupt the sodium potassium membranes. We'll talk about this later, but just for now, let's talk, of, let's, let's remember the treatment. Every one of these could be treated with band azoles. Okay. Let's talk about the cutaneous ones, once again, band azoles. Ankylostoma, band azoles. Nectar americansis, band azoles. Okay. Are we clear? Yes or no? Now, everyone, are we clear? Let's talk about the last one. These, these ones over here, except um, Onkosharka, Loa Loa, and Wusheria, they are treated with a D and Onkosharka is treated with a I. So, okay. So, B did it. Okay. Did Dr. B do well in her NDME today? Yes or no? Fast answers, please. Okay. It's a rhetorical question. Yes. So B did it. Are we clear? So we'll use the news of Dr. B today to remember the mnemonic for the treatment of nematodes. Who did it? B did it. Are we clear? Yes or no? Let's move on to the next one. Easy or not easy, the treatments of nematodes, yes or no? Let's move on to the next one. Let's move on to cystodes. Okay, how are we doing in terms of uh, having our ball of focus, our attention in the lecture? Everyone, can I get some feedback, please? How are we doing in terms of understanding the lecture, keeping our attention in the lecture? Okay, trying to balance it out. How, how many of us got diverted about, um, how many of us got diverted from learning the treatment of nematodes and moved our attention to what we're gonna have for lunch today? Okay. Please say me in the chat box. No. Um, let's begin with systems. Is, is everyone ready? Yes or no? No. Systems. Uh, there is no need to use any sort of mnemonics for systems. I'm thinking of when to revise all of this. We'll revise all of this in 15 minutes and you will see that you remember everything. I can promise you, okay? Don't, don't, don't worry, just keep your attention to systodes and you'll see what I'm talking about, okay? Systodes. The first systole that I'm gonna talk about is tinasis. It's called a tinea solium. I'm pretty sure you guys know what a tinasis is. Yes, I know. It's what we call T for tinea, T for tapeworm. 
E for table. How many types of TNASs can we have? We can have two types of TNASs. One is known as TNIA, TNIA from the pork. Another one is TNIA from the beef, from beef. Undercooked pork or undercooked beef could spread this organism. So how do you have the entrance of the organism? Obviously to the fecal oral root, yes or no? Yes or no? So to the fecal oral root, we have the organism that enters. Now what happens is that sometimes these organisms, they will cause your usual uh, fever, diarrhea, uh, followed by constipation, anemia, and all of those things. But there's one, dev one devastating uh, constellation of sign symptoms that can happen. This is known as neurocysticarcosis. Where you will see this sort of dots. Okay. Now, dots in the brain. Can anyone tell me very quickly, what would happen if one of these cysts, if they rupture? Pass chances, please. What would happen if one of these cysts are not dead? Okay, you will not die, but you will get anaphylaxis. Dead. <laughs> okay, you, you, you will not die, you'll get anaphylaxis. Okay. If, if no one manages your anaphylaxis, then you might die. Okay. But you will get severe anaphylaxis now. Let's, let's talk about the surgical management. This is a very big challenge for surgeons to remove the cyst. Do we have Dr. Mazin with us today? Yes or no? Oh. No. Okay. Is anyone over here a surgeon? Did anyone over here work in the neurosurgical department? No one. Okay. Let's talk about this. Okay. This is the cerebral hemisphere with the cysts. Now the surgeons, they have to remove the cysts, but they have to make sure that the cysts do not rupture. So they cannot rupture the cyst or else the patients will have severe anaphylaxis and die in the OT table. The second thing is they cannot remove a tissue of the brain. Can you remove a tissue from the brain? Uh, let's say, you know, like how in a biopsy, we take the surrounding and we take the surrounding tissue. So you cannot do that either. So what do you do? So there's a new method, which doctors do nowadays. What they do is instead of cutting or doing anything, they take a needle, okay? And if you're thinking that they're gonna puncture the cyst then you're thinking wrong, what they do is that they take a needle filled with normal saline and they very carefully place the tip of the needle right below the cyst and they spurt in water. This water creates a pressure which gets the cysts out and very carefully they remove the cysts. They do not aspirate it. They do not aspirate the cyst. They take the needle, they very carefully place the tip of the needle a bit distant from the cyst, but they push saline, saline water right below the cyst, which the water pressure put, pushes the cyst out. Are we clear? Yes or no? Because these cysts are very superficial. Okay. Fascinating or not fascinating? Okay. Pretty fascinating. Okay. So that's that. Now, is this important for your step one exam? Um, no. Okay. Is this important for your step two exam? Yes. Is it important for step one exam if they ask you clinical questions? I'm not sure because nowadays they're asking a lot of clinical questions. So this is something worth sharing, okay? Now, let's move on to the next one. Let's move on to what would happen if you have, is it a common condition? It, it is a pretty common, it is a pretty common condition if um, people are more prone to have undercooked meat. How many of us have heard of the dish called beef tartar? Beef tartar. 
So you guys know what beef tartar is, right? Beef tartar is nothing but raw beef that is served with garnish and um, different sorts of um, uh, spices. And here and then it's basically a raw beef, which, um, which um, people have. Now, if you have one beef tartar once in your life, it won't be a problem. If you have beef tartar, let's say the other day, there might be a problem. Dr. Ahmed says that uh, teniasis is not there in your country. Teniasis should not be in your country or in my country or in any other country because in our country, having uh, raw beef is more or less a taboo in most households. And you know how in our countries, we always overcook our beef more or less. Okay, we make kebabs out of it. So all the teniasis in the beefs are now kebab teniasis and they do not have a lot of power, right? And um, so that's basically the reason why we do not have teniasis in our countries, right? But over here, there's a higher chance. Now let's talk about what would happen if you have a lot of sushi all the time, sushi and sashimis. Okay. What do we get? We get a very famous disease with the name of diphylobotrum latum. This is called fish tapeworm. Okay. Fish tapeworm. Now, the only thing you have to remember about fish tapeworm is the mode of ingestion. First of all, having raw fish is the mode of ingestion. And what is the disease caused by diphylobotum? The disease caused by diphylobotum is that for some weird reason, this diphylobotum, what they do, diphylobotum, what they do is that they cause deficiency of vitamin B12. Okay. They cause deficiency of vitamin B12 and patients get what type of anemia? Last answer, please. Megaloblastic anemia. Okay. Yep. Vitamin B12, is it necessary to make, um, is it necessary for vitamin B12 to be involved in the process of synthesis of methanin? Yes or no? Is it important for the vitamin B12 to increase the, um, to increase the production of um, proteins that will stop your genetic transcription and translation? Yes or no? If we do not have vitamin B12, can we have unregulated proliferation of cells? Yes or no? no. Is this why we have hypersegmentations of neutrophils, megaloblastic anemia, where the cytoplasm is bigger than, uh, where the nucleus of cytoplasmic ratio is not balanced, right? So this is basically the reason. Do we also get um, megaloblastic anemia with uh, folate deficiency? Yes or no? Why do we get megaloblastic anemia with folate deficiency? Because folate is responsible for the synthesis of DNAs. Yes. Okay. Now let's move on to the next one. Let's move on to this one, the last system. This is called echinococcus granulosus. Also known as dog tapeworm. Okay. A kind of corpus granulosus, also known as dog tapeworms. Now these are spread if you have a pet dog in your house. And if you're not careful with the food you eat, these are spread from dog feces. And I need to put some amount of information over here and I need you to put your attention in this one because what they do over here is very similar to an amoebic liver abscess. What they do is that when you ingest this thing over here, okay, they will go to your intestines. From there, they'll go to your liver and they'll form a cyst in the liver. And this cyst will have surrounding calcification. Does an amoebic liver abscess have surrounding calcification? Yes or no? The answer is no. Okay. So that's that. This is called hydrated cyst. Very similar to an amoebic liver abscess. The sign symptoms are going to be the same, more or less, except the fact that over here there will be 
uh, micro calcification. We sometimes like would like to call this as eggshell calcification. Are we clear? Yes or no? Now, if there is a doctor who can treat um, kinia, who can treat diphylobotrum, and who can treat echinococcus, uh, does that doctor um, does that doctor deserve a prize? Yes or no? Because he or she is capable of treating all of these things at the same time. Okay, so they obviously deserve a prize because they work so hard to treat this condition. You can treat all of this with prize or prazic punto. Are we clear? Yes or no? We'll talk about this later. Echinococcus granulosus could be treated with praziquintil or albendazole. But to keep things simple, please remember praziquintil. Okay, are we clear? Yes or no? Yes, right here. With that being said, we're done with cystodes. Okay, now let's talk about the last one for today, that is trematodes. What are trematodes? Trematodes consist of two organisms that are extremely high yield. And one of its organisms is very, very famous. It's this one. This one is, does anyone know the name? How do you remember these names? Price. Are you, are you talking about the names of um, the drugs? Yes or no? Both. You don't have to remember the name of these things. Well, you have to remember the names of these things. But to be honest, tenaces, diphylobotrum, and epinococcus, are they very new organisms or have we heard of them before in our bachelors of medicine and surgery? These are basically very... Um, old organisms. The thing is for step one, do you, have to, do you have to know about all of these organisms the way we studied this from microbiology? Yes or no? You know, in microbiology, we talked about their life cycle. We talked about this, we talked about that. Okay, this is, we, we don't really have to know much. We have to know just enough for clinical treatment and, ident and clinical identification. Okay. If, do, you, do you realize that we are finishing parasitology in one day, whereas in bachelor's, it took you two months to finish parasitology, yes or no? And today you're finishing it in, in just one single day because the questions are very direct, okay? Yes, and then you forgot, but you will obviously remember this because this is exactly what you need for your treatment purposes in your uh, clinical uh, setting, so that's right. Now let's talk about the first one over here. S S is a very famous organism. S is for schistosomiasis. Schistosomiasis. Now we have two types. Schistosomiasis. We have one that looks like this. And we have one that looks like this. Okay. Now, let's talk about the first one. This is Schistosoma mansoni. Okay. So this, this one, they have a lateral spine. Okay. They have a lateral spine. This is known as Schistosoma hematobium. They have a terminal spine. Their spine is over here. Okay. Now, what happens is, first of all, how do we get infected by this? Let, let's talk about this. I'm, I'm pretty sure you guys know that the mode of infection by this is if there is a patient who would have a history of swimming in a lake. Yes or no? They have a history of swimming in a lake. 
and the lakes could have a host or a vector. The host are snails. Okay. So the parasite would roam around, the patients would be swimming, okay? And the parasites will gain entry, how? Either through the nose or worst case scenario, to the urethra. Now let's, let, let's talk about the urethral one first. The organism that can gain entry to the urethra is Schizosoma hematobium. What happens is that when they, gain en when they gain entry to the urethra, where do they go? They go to the bladder and they cause what? Squamous cell carcinoma. This is very common in Egypt. Yes or no? Do we have any Egyptian, uh, Egyptian students with us today? Anyone from Egypt? Anyone? No. Okay. Do we have friends in Egypt? Okay. Dr. Yasser. So you, okay. So that way. Okay. So schizosoma hematobium is a very common disease <clears throat> for causing squamous cell carcinoma in the bladder. And schizosoma mantini, what it, what it will do is if it gains, if the mantini, if it gains entry into your blood, let's say through the nose, it enters your blood then it enters a GI tract, yes? From the GI tract, where will they go? They will go to the liver and they can cause portal hypertension. Will they, uh, what is the name of the organism that can cause ileocecal obstruction and biliary obstruction? Ascaricis. What is the name of the organism that can cause um, portal hypertension? Schistosomiasis. Are we clear? Yes or no? Two types of conditions for two types of parasites. Okay, last one. What is the name of the organism that can cause cholangitis? That is, what is cholangitis? Is it inflammation of the biliary tract? Yes or no? The name of the organism which causes cholangitis is cholangitis, cholangitis sinensis, or we would like to call this as clonorchis sinensis. How do we get this? How do we get this organism? We get this organism if we have undercooked fish. With long-term cholangitis, isn't there a possibility this organism can cause um, cholangiocarcinoma? Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. The doctors were responsible for treating schistosomiasis and cholangitis. Do they deserve a price? Answer is yes. How do you treat them? Consequently. Very good. Okay, we're very close towards the end. Yes, this is the liver fluke. Okay. We're very close towards the end. Are we ready for the last one, ectoparasites? Okay. Now, how many of us have heard or seen patients of scabies? Very common disease in third world countries, especially in people, uh, especially amongst people who live in very close quarters and who live in unhygienic conditions. What happens is that there's a there is a type of scabies called once again female sarcoptis scabies. Hominis. 
This is a subtype of scabies organism. Female Sarcoptus scabies hominis, what they do is that these parasites, they live outside as bugs. Okay? And when they see a skin, they pierce into the skin and they enter into the skin. And when they move, they move like this, like the cutaneous larva migraines. Okay? Now, the difference between this and cutaneous larva, larva migraines is that the, there are larva migraines will never come out. These ones, they can come out of your skin and go and affect another person, or they can go to different parts of your body and again, pierce the skin and cause these types of serpentous region. Okay. So th that's that. That's basically what it is. How do you treat them? First of all, hygiene maintenance. You have to maintain your hygiene. You have to shower properly every day, clean your bed sheets, clean your clothes, stay away from infected individuals because is this highly contagious? Yes or no? Scabies? Is this highly contagious? The answer is yes. I remember having a colleague who had scabies but from treating a patient with scabies. So that's bad. Now, how do you treat them? You treat them with parmitin, ivermectin. Okay. And basically, there are some other ways you can treat uh, this condition, but these are basically the two modalities of treatment in the US, parmitin cream and ivermectin. Are we clear, yes or no? If you receive a question about burrows in the hand, you know what burrows is? Burrows are the region where the scabies will come out, okay? For example, in jungles or in muds, have we seen these small burrows from where uh, ants come out? Yes or no? Okay. This is the same thing that will happen to a patient's skin in a very microscopic um, appearance. Last one for today is pediculus humanus. Ridiculous humanist. This is what we call as um, lice. Are we clear? Yes or no? This is a lice. Okay. Now, where do we get lice? There could be three types of lice. That is one in the hair, one in your body, and one in the pubic region. Okay. Do they cause intense pruritus? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Do they cause excoriations? That is, the pruritus will be so intense that you would feel as if you would have to take a piece of your skin out. So that causes excoriations, that's that. And another one about scabies, which I forgot to mention, the scabies are itching. Will it be intense in the day or intense in the night? In terms of the night, okay. Why? Because at night, our itching threshold and pain threshold level, they, do they decrease or increase? Threshold level increase or decrease? If it increases, then you can withstand a lot of pain and you can withstand a lot of pruritus. Obviously, it decreases, right? That's why you cannot. Okay, and that's it. How do you treat this condition? Guys, how do you treat this condition? Parmitin. Ivermectin. Another one we would like to use is Marathion. Are we clear, everyone? Yes or no? Okay. Now let's witness something. If you have a patient who has cholangitis due to a parasite, okay, history of having undercooked fish, what is your diagnosis? Clonorchus sinensis. Okay. Why itching at night? Itching is more at night because your itching threshold and your pain threshold. What do we mean by threshold? 
means the ability to withstand pain, the ability to withstand itching, it decreases. So you cannot withstand a lot of pain or itching. So you itch and you itch a lot. And if, if anything is tender, it hurts a lot. Have my address and there. Okay, next one, cysts in the brain. And cysts in the brain, and the patient has, um, let's say, history of undercooked fish, uh, my apologies, undercooked beef or pork. There we go. Neurocystic sarcosis, pupil, kinesis. Okay, how about painless hematuria? Which one, the man or the heme? The schistosomy, hematobium. Okay, now, history of camping, fatty stool. Something that looks like this. Geodiasis. Liver abscess, anchovy sauce pus and malabsorption and fatty stool and bloody diarrhea. A uh, diarrhea in AIDS. And something that looks like this, these two balls, cryptosporidium. Okay. Then what else? Um, Cats as pets, and now patients have seizures, fever, convulsion, somnolence, and um, ring enhancing lesions. Toxoplasma. Okay. History of um, history of being in a freshwater pool or pond and meningoencephalitis sign symptoms: fever, neck rigidity, confusion, convulsion, vomiting, nightmare. Okay. Fever, enlarged lymph nodes, and severe somnolence and sleeping pattern. Okay. Hypenosoma, brute suit, very good. And that's it. Fever on the fourth day, sixth day, another one is irregular fever with vessel occlusion. Malaria. That's it. Fever, hemolytic anemia. Babesia. Okay. Fever, uh, no fever. We have um, dilatations of the esophagus, dilatations of the um, colon, and periorbital unilateral swelling. Okay, next one is um, fever, hepatosplenomegaly, pancytopenia. And when you do peripheral blood film, you see a macrophage with a lot of amnesticles. The green is discharged from the female genital tract, um, spread by phacomonas. Okay. Okay. Now, even quicker questions and quicker answers for rapid fire. Now, quick questions, quick answers. Is everyone ready? Yes or no? Everyone ready? Okay. Good. Severe anal pruritus. Okay. Biliary tract obstruction with um, history of fecal oral transmission as to very good. Um, then what do we have? And then what do we have? We have muscle inflammation, severe muscle inflammation. Pichinella, rectal prolapse. Very good. Toxic car going to different tissues, causing myocarditis, hepatitis, encephalitis. Very good. Then piercing through the skin in the form of a of a larva of a larva that looks like a rabies that, that has a name of a rabies, and that can cause normocytic anemia. It can cause auto infection. Very good. 
same type of larva, but now this one causes microcytic anemia, serpentinous rash, and hypersensitivity pneumonitis in the form of Lufer syndrome. Very well. Then you go in front of a mirror and you scream, no, no, because you have a worm in your eyes for low, low. Very well. Okay, next one. Um, you have a patient from a Southeast Asian country coming to you with severe swelling of one leg. You can, there's no pitting edema. Patient has a history of living in a mud house. Very good. Everything for this patient is dark. The patient sees dark, has a dark nodule. Okay, good. Okay, fish tapeworm causing vitamin B12 deficiency. That's all about the beef and pork ingestion with fever, convulsion, seizures, kinesis, um, severe cholangitis and cholangiocarcinoma due to a fecal oral, uh, I mean, due to um, a severe cholangitis and cholangiocarcinoma, not fecal oral, with a history of uh, swimming in um, fresh water that has snails. Very good. Schistosoma, Manseni. I think I kind of mix it up. My apologies. Let me just say this one more time. Uh, portal hypertension, not cholangitis. That's why you guys got, got, got confused. Portal hypertension. Manseni, very good. Now, cholangitis and cholangiocarcinoma. Severe, um, severe itching, especially at night with burrows and people living in close contact, okay? And last one is severe itching in the head, pubic region, and body area, lice, area. Okay. So congratulations are in order. Thank you so much. You guys have successfully finished parasitology. Are we clear? Yes or no? Now, how do you know if you have finished it well or if you have finished it um, not well? You have to test yourself, yes or no? How do you test yourself? You have to do it with the questions. Okay. Please make sure that you do questions on the new world. Okay. Now, this week, we are going to have a um, small exam over the weekend <coughs> where I will post questions from biochemistry and microbiology, and we will assess how much we have learned in the past two weeks of basic sciences. Are we clear yet or no? Now, with that being said, thank you so much for putting your attention in the lecture. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for answering all the questions. And thank you so much for keeping your ball of attention in the entire, the entire time in our lecture. I apologize for my performance today. I was just feeling a little bit under the weather for which I had to start the class a little bit later. But all in all, I would say that we didn't do pretty bad. Yes or no? Because we finished parasitology. That's that's quite big. Okay. So tomorrow we are going to start our lecture with the goal of initiating biology. Okay, biology is very high yield. Biology requires a lot of uh, information that needs to be that needs to be remembered. For example, do you remember our first class on basic bacteriology? Yes or no? P chunks, this and that. Ricky, Chlamydia, and all of those things, yes? Do you realize that the first class, since we put our attention in the first class of basic bacteria, the systemic bacteria were a little bit easy? Yes or no? The same thing will happen tomorrow with basic virology. We think if we put a little bit of attention in the basic virology, the systemic virology will be a little bit easy. So that's basically what I'm trying to say. Thank you so much. It's already um, bittersweet that class is ending. So yes, the class is gonna end soon. That is true. We do not have a lot of classes left. Okay, that's it. Okay, zoonotic bacteria. Yes. Okay, zoonotic bacteria are something which I'll give you guys a homework for. Okay, this is not something which we can discuss because it's about completely. Uh, it doesn't yield a lot of information, and it's not very very high yield except for two bacteria. What are the names of two those two bacteria which you will be tested from zoonotic bacteria? One is Anaplasma, another one is Ehrlichia. Are we clear? Yes or no? Okay. So we'll talk about this over the weekend, no problem. For today, can we keep our lectures up to here? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. 
thank you so much. Hope you guys have a great day. Uh, if you guys have any questions, please send us an email. If you guys have friends who wants to come and join the lecture, please let them know that we're going to start with immunology after microbiology, so they can register right now. They can send us an email. And uh, if all is well, I would like to take my leave right now, and I'll see you guys tomorrow at 10.30 a.m. Okay. Thank you so much, and have a great day. Bye-bye.